I am going to get started. Again, I'm Liza Meyer. I'm the Chief Landscape Architect with the City of Boston Parks Department. This is our second meeting today on the Franklin Park Action Plan, and both of these meetings have had the same content. So if you attended at noon today, you're gonna to hear um, the same thing tonight, and you're welcome to stay, um, but just know that that's the case. Um, as you can see, this is gonna be a little different from our last public meeting. It will be an online presentation by the project team with opportunities for feedback, polls, as well as question and answer. So throughout the presentation, if you have any questions or comments, please type them into the Q&A box, which is located, you can see it at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, you can put your questions in at any point and we'll answer them as we go or we'll save them um, for a direct Q&A at the end. Both are options. For those of you who are on the phone, you can text your questions to the phone number I gave you a minute ago. It's 617-779-2227. And we know that this style of meeting can feel limiting, which is why we have also planned a series of engagements uh, throughout the month to share this information in greater detail and hear feedback, um, opportunities for discussions, different Zoom meetings where we can all see each other and, and talk in, in more of a shared conversation, as well as some online um, interactions. So we'll cover more information about those different engagements over the course of the presentation tonight, but I wanted people to be aware that this is not the only time you will have a chance to engage with us um, in the coming weeks. We wanna make sure everybody knows that this meeting is being recorded and it will be available on the project website in a couple of days. The project website is franklinparkactionplan.com. So if you know someone who wasn't able to attend today, um, please let them know that it'll be posted up there uh, shortly. And uh, lastly, before we jump into the meeting content, I wanna flag that this meeting is available in four different languages. So call-in information is on the screen here, and I'll introduce each interpreter who will then introduce themselves and provide the call-in number verbally for those who cannot see this Zoom screen. Um, so let's just take a minute to do that, and we can start with Terence Moran, the Spanish interpreter. Okay, pues yo soy Terry, soy el intérprete en español. Si alguien lo necesite, el número que tiene en la pantalla, si lo pueden ver, es 929-299-3395. Y una vez que marque, tiene que marcar un PIN, un, un código, que es 153-736-314, y con el pound al final. Thank you. And uh, Raimundo Marrera, Cape Verdean interpreter. Raimundo, if you're not on, um, Ava Rosa, will you, will you please um, introduce yourself? Yes, um, so my name is Eva Rosa. Um, so you want me to introduce in, in my language, right? Yes. Yes, please. Okay. Sim, meu nome é Eva Rosa. Então, me intérprete Cabo Verdeano hoje. Se eu tenho qualquer alguém que fala a língua Cabo Verdeano, se tem alguma pergunta, uh, pode chamar aquele número ali, 401-375-9513. E tem um número de código que é um PIN, é 708-334-9171. Depois, asterisco no fim, que, que é pound. Qualquer coisa, chama aquela. Obrigada. Thank you. And Wei Li? Hey,大家好,我是你的中文翻译 Thank you. And last, Perrette Durandis. She's still muted. Hold on.
Kira, you can unmute yourself. Go ahead. Okay, hello, bonsoir. No, moi, c'est Perrette et c'est moi-même qui va interpréter la partie créole. Là, ici, nous soulignons qu'il y a une autre question. Nous sommes capables de le numéro 513-463-89-73. Et puis, le, nous avons pris le numéro 1, c'est 472 600-319. 472-600-319. Trois cent dix neuf, trois un neuf, et puis on a fait et pound à brûler. Merci. Thank you. And I want to just make sure that for those of you who are on the phone and wanted uh, the phone number that you could text questions to, that number again is six one seven 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 nine two two three seven. And we'll repeat it again if if you just missed it. Um, but thank you for everyone's patience as we shared all of that introductory information and now we can dive in. So welcome to the Franklin Park Action Plan second public workshop. While we wish we were together in the park, we're so grateful that you were able to join us here this way tonight and we hope to have a productive meeting, share a lot of information and get started towards the next phase of the project. So first we're going to hear from Commissioner Ryan Woods. Thank you, Liza, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. It's really helpful um, that you're adding stuff into the chat. Um, we're still trying to learn the best ways to engage with people, whether it's signs you saw in the park, social media, if you saw it on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, flyers or emails from the coalition and ENC and Arbor Way, um, or if it was in the local newspaper. I think the JP newspaper had some stuff today. So um, it's great, and the more feedback you can give us, this will help us as we engage uh, on this project and future projects. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Ryan Woods, and I have the pleasure of serving as the City of Boston Parks Commissioner. Um, as we've seen um, throughout this pandemic, Franklin Park continues to be an active space. It's Boston's largest park, and it's a place for play, celebration, a place for health and well-being, a community space for gatherings, especially now with social distancing, giving us all enough space to spread out our six feet. Um, it's a place for respite, relaxation, and there's plenty of trails, pathways, and wilderness to explore. It's a place where thousands recently came together to support Black lives and much needed change. Uh, it's an important time for all of us to reevaluate this beloved space, make sure it continues to be a place for those of us to come together and be heard. We wanna hear all your voices, feedback, and the support that we're getting from you and your ambition and willingness to engage in this community process is very encouraging. We have some exciting new news. Uh, at the city with uh, larger initiatives that have just happened to advance not only this project, but future projects. Uh, Mayor Walsh appointed last week a new cabinet level position of a chief of equity and inclusion in Dr. Carolyn Crockett. We're very excited to have Carolyn with us at the city and look forward to working with her team uh, in engagement, not only on this project, but all of our future projects. This action plan for Franklin Park is very exciting because there's money behind it. From the sale of Winthrop Square, $28 million is going to uh, be put into Franklin Park specifically. 23 million of that is capital funds for capital projects. And 5 million uh, was put aside in an endowment, which will help with maintenance and uh, teaming up with the Franklin Park Coalition on programming uh, in perpetuity for this park. So that will be an annual interest that we will get off of that $5 million that will continue to go into the park even when um, the capital money is all spent out. We're excited about a new website. There's increased engagement opportunities. There's now gonna be mini polls. There's opportunities to share feedback. And we are very impressed so far to have over 6,000 people take place in the survey to date um, to help us with this. The design team is working together to collaborate everything we've heard from the first community meeting when we were in person at the golf course uh, and all the surveys. And we're breaking it down into themes such as history, community, connection, and ecology. So there's opportunities for residents to engage in the entire project and process, or if you have a particular area of interest, whether it be the history or ecology, community, et cetera, you can focus in on that one specific area if you'd like to. This will form our goals of the action plan, which will in turn give us some action steps to move forward. 
two more exciting things um, that I wanted to mention this summer. Uh, it's very tough getting youth to be outside and to work. But, excuse me, the mayor was able to add a Blue Shirts program. That is a program similar to, if you're familiar in the late 80s and early 90s, there was some pro a program called the Red Shirts where um, youth are outside helping to clean up spaces and vacant lots. And this year, um, so far we have over 75 youth and they're still adding every day um, to join in on this program. And we have 30 youth specifically in Franklin Park that are walking around cleaning up, picking weeds, um, doing extra activities in the park. Um, so we're really excited to have them with us this summer. And in this past budget that was just recently approved, we're gonna be adding a second shift for maintenance. So this means we will be able to have um, at least a crew of four to five maintenance employees that will be working from one to 9 p.m. on Wednesday through Sundays. So our normal shifts of seven to three will be augmented and we'll have extra um, hands in the park to help, whether it's emptying trash barrels, responding to emergencies, and they'll be located right here in Franklin Park so they can respond to issues in Franklin Park, West Roxbury, or issues that are more in the central area of Boston, um, instead of having to wait for a crew to come on the next morning. So we're very exciting to see that uh, starting coming up this winter. So thank you for being engaged, for helping us uh, with this plan. Uh, we always wanna make sure it continues to be a safe, welcoming, and a place the community continue to come together. So with that being said, thank you, and we'll move forward with the presentation. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, I made a mistake earlier, and I need to correct it now, and gave everybody the wrong phone number to reach um, if you want to text any responses or ask questions if you're on the phone. So the correct number is 617-799-2237. My apologies. Again, we'll still read it out. Um, I'm going to turn this right over to John Kett from uh, the project team to take us to, through the agenda and into um, the presentation tonight. Great, thanks Liza. Uh, hello everyone, I'm John Kett. I'm the managing principal of Reed Hildebrand. We're the lead design firm for this effort for the city of Boston. We're collaborating with two partners, two, key, two prime partners, Agency Landscape and Planning and Mass Design Group. And you'll hear from all of us today, as well as from our teammate Stephen Gray of Grayscale Collaborative. We're also supported, as you can see on this diagram, by many experts, uh, ranging in their disciplines from ecology and soil science to equity and public health. Uh, and in recognition that a project of this significance really demands the best consultant team that we can compile. Stephen and I want to start by uh, giving an update on, a, on a, a really important update on the naming of the project moving forward. Yeah, thanks, John. So um, you might have noticed if you'd attended uh, earlier meetings that um, this project was, this process was called the Franklin Park Master Plan, uh, and we've changed the name to the Franklin Park Action Plan. Um, and this is primarily to acknowledge um, that, you know, we're going to be taking action on the information that we get and the input that we get from the community, and that that action is backed by $28 million, as Commissioner Woods uh, mentioned, um, of investment in Franklin Park. So with your help um, and the help of others who have attended other meetings and will attend future meetings, um, we will be making recommendations for improved amenities, infrastructure, uh, landscape, maintenance, and programming. And we just wanna be very clear that, you know, the Franklin Park is a large space, um, but there are different designations within the park that have different planning efforts and different pots of money associated with them. And so the, the $28 million that will be allocated to implementing the outcomes of this plan will go into the areas that you see in this map um, shaded in kind of pinkish brown. Um, and it will not go towards White Stadium, the zoo, the golf course, Shattuck Hospital, or the maintenance yard. Um, those will be um, considered in our planning process as will the ed neighborhood edges around all of the edges of the park, but the area that you see shaded is the area that will be the primary focus for this funding and for this planning process. I did it again. I missed my mute button twice on that transition. Um, it's like my first Zoom. Uh, so uh, the Franklin Park Action Plan, while the name is new, as Stephen just described, the plan is, uh, was really started in the fall of 2019. 
and we've been focused on the analysis of existing conditions and broad community engagement since then. As I'm sure everyone here is all too aware, and as Liza described, a lot has changed in the last few months since our last public meeting in January. I have to say that it's been amazing to see the significance of Franklin Park for this community and how the park has functioned for the health and well-being of its neighbors during this time. Every time we have visited the park, which has been quite a bit these past months in particular, we've seen the park at its best, a place to get outside, to convene with friends and neighbors at a safe distance, a place to protest, as Commissioner Ryan said, and express our, your beliefs, and to get some physical and mental relief from the challenges in the world today. At the same time, due to COVID, we've had to adjust the timing and approach slightly, and today we're wrapping up the fact-finding phase and moving into the testing of, of ideas and actions, really moving from our analysis into proposals. When COVID-19 became a part of our lives in mid-March, we were forced to postpone the second meeting from April to today. While concerns for the public health and well-being of our neighbors has required us to be more online and physically distanced, we continue to be committed to a plan that is driven by the community. So we've adapted our engagement process to offer new ways to engage over the summer. Uh, we'll explain more in the next few slides. You may have learned about this in many different ways, like Commissioner Ryan uh, said, and as we've seen in the chat, uh, through a postcard, seeing a sign in the park from Mayor Walsh's recent press conference where he dedicated 30 seconds at least to talking about the park, which was great, or staying in touch by our website or social media and emails. For those of you who are on the phone or wanna review the presentation afterwards, as Liza said, the presentation, a video of this meeting with closed caption translations will be available for download on the website in the next couple of days. You can also contact Lauren Bryant with the city of Boston to obtain a hard copy of the presentation or to share more ideas. And her email is again, lauren.bryant at boston.gov. So the analysis that you'll see today that we'll be presenting is based on a quite a lot of community feedback to date. Um, you know, in the beginning of this process, we really wanted to make sure that we were trying to reach out and be as inclusive as possible. And so um, at what point uh, members of the design team in the city actually went out canvassed and door knocked and talked to almost 3000 uh, residents and neighbors in surrounding neighborhoods around Franklin Park. Um, that was an acknowledgement of the fact that although um, our community meetings in person have been very well attended, standing room only, um, they have not been completely representative um, in the ways that we would like them to be. And so um, we were able to canvas and go door knocking, go to people where they actually live and have conversations on people's front porches, inviting them to into the process and answering questions in person. Um, we also uh, conducted a community survey um, which we were able to get 6,000, over 6,000 uh, inputs from residents uh, living around Franklin Park. Um, another thing that we did at the beginning was identify um, roughly 80 organizations or roughly 70 or 75, 80 organizations um, that are doing work in and around Franklin Park. And we doubled that number at the first meeting. You can see on the right-hand side in that image, people standing around that map that you can see Franklin Park sort of glowing in the middle. And we asked the public to identify other community organizations that were not already on our list that we should be meeting with. Um, and we have also begun the process of talking with those community organizations and tapping into those networks. The community survey that uh, reached over 6,000 residents um, was perhaps one of our most successful outreach uh, activities to date for this planning process. Um, and we were actually able to uh, get a quite a large showing of the black residents that live around Fra Franklin Park. Um, those are the residents that um, in, in terms of numbers and proportion are less represented in some of the community in-person community meetings. And so we really see that this was an opportunity um, and a success to reach out to people who um, don't have the capacity, the time, the resources to be able to attend the meetings in person. We're also hopeful that these Zoom formats, while they don't reach everyone, um, might reach some other people that might not have attended in person, but now with the sort of login and the call in and two options, um, may be able to attend some of these meetings. So I really can't overstate how important all of this feedback is to the process. 
uh, as Stephen mentioned. So we've created many more COVID safe ways to engage over the summer. Um, you can find all this information on the website, but I'll walk you through it now too. First, the team has created a draft of our analysis so far. We'll give you an overview today, but that's not everything. And so you can view the analysis summaries on the website to dig deeper and to give feedback. After today's, today's presentation, we'll be launching a mini poll to gather your thoughts on the draft principles for the project that we'll review at the end, which should only take a couple of minutes to complete. You can find both polls on the website at franklinparkactionplan.com. We also recognize that we're sharing a lot of information here today, and this is the second time we've done it, and that it's going to take time for you to digest and to form your responses. So to that end, over the next couple of weeks, we've established a series of themed discussion groups that you can sign up for to dig deeper into the four analysis topics we'll be sharing tonight. These are, will be smaller community sessions where we'll spend time listening and discussing the analysis and future next steps. Please sign up on the website if you'd like to join these. Now we wanna give some perspective on our four analysis themes, which we'll walk through in detail with you today. These are history, communities, connection, and ecology, and ecology excuse me. So John, you, you mentioned the COVID situation that we're all kind of living through and adapting to. Um, another parallel crisis has manifest during this period, um, which is uh, sort of brought about by a long overdue national conversation about structural racism. Um, and parks and open spaces um, in general, and Franklin Park in particular, um, has become a pivotal place for demonstration and discussion about racial justice. Next slide, please. So, you know, when we think about the history of Franklin Park, um, it's, it's one of the sort of crowning achievements of Frederick Law Olmsted, which was a landscape architect um, in the late uh, 19th century. And, you know, Olmsted is known for um, really his masterful integration of, you know, promoting natural systems and, and helping to sort of guide those through urban areas, um, creating spaces that promote um, health, physical health, but also social health and place for democratic exchange. So even before Olmsted, you know, got involved in sort of imagining uh, what Franklin Park could be and the Emerald Necklace, um, this was the land and continues to be the land of the Massachusetts tribe, both uh, past, present, and in the future. Um, and more recently has been shaped by committed stewards um, from in and around the neighborhood, uh, from community programmers like Alma Lewis, and more recently Catherine Morris, who hosts BAMS Fest every year, uh, to the Franklin Park Golfers Association and the Franklin Park Coalition. Um, so this space has really been uh, for a long time the center for speech and uh, exchange um, for the community and for the city at large. So, you know, Franklin Park, as with all public spaces, um, should be completely accessible and open to the public. But we recognize, and we can see in these maps, that access and opportunity are not equally shared by all communities that surround the park. Um, and so it's important that through this process, we acknowledge those barriers. Um, for example, some people have, will have uh, barriers to attending a Zoom meeting or a call um, that they might not have for an in-person meeting. Some people have barriers to in-person meetings that they might not have when they receive a survey or an email. And some people may respond better just by being sort of uh, engaged at their door. So we've tried to engage people in all of these different ways. And the recommendations that we are going to be sort of exploring are going to build upon our, the feedback uh, that we receive from you um, as we think about access, equity, and improved amenities. So in addition to looking outward to understand the neighborhoods and communities around Franklin Park, we appreciate the importance of the physical connections at the park's edge. This is likely a familiar view to many of you. If you've ever tried to walk or bike or take transit to Franklin Park, you probably agree that we could spend this entire meeting talking about entrances, road crossings, bus stops, and traffic on Circuit Drive. But the physical connections are important. Next slide, please. 
uh, because they foster social connections. And let's be honest, those are more important right now than ever. So we see this action plan as a chance to improve the physical environment so it can make us a better and stronger community. We also recognize the significance of the ecological systems in a large urban park like Franklin Park. Scarborough Pond is a great example of the value of nature and these ecological systems at work in the park. In fact, many of our community engagement responses spoke about the importance of the park as a place to access and find relaxation in nature. But nature is not just something that is aesthetically pleasing or nice to have. If our ecological systems aren't working well, we feel the pain in our own health and comfort. Looking at the maps on the screen, the one on the left shows tree canopy cover in the city of Boston. The Franklin Park is at the center and the darker tones represent more consistent cover from canopy trees. And the map on the right shows the surface temperatures associated with that. So you can see a direct cor correlation between areas where there is significant tree coverage and, and cooler temperatures. This shows us how these natural systems reduce the heat island effect compared to the areas around it, creating a comfortable place to be. So now I'm gonna pass over to my, actually now I'm gonna take a pause for uh, the interpreters to switch over. Uh, and then I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Lydia Cook, who is the design team project manager for this effort. And she will give an overview of the rich and layered history of Franklin Park. So we'll take about 30 seconds to allow the interpreters to switch over. All right, um, I think we'll get back started uh, with the history theme. Hi everyone, I'm Lydia Cook. I'm a landscape architect and associate at Reed Holder Brand. Oftentimes in our work, we find ourselves looking back in order to look forward. So today I wanna to share a little bit about what we've learned about the significance of this place, the origins of the park's design, and a bit about those who have lived around and cared for the park, making it an incredible community asset. First, we want to share that we really truly appreciate the hundreds of personal memories and aspirations that you've shared with our team. It was so helpful to hear in your own words what makes this place so special, how it's been an important part of your lives, and how the park has served its neighbors. So in order to talk about the past, we really have to start with the land. We first want to recognize that there are a lot of people who have left their mark on this place throughout time and that the history runs deep. It's rich, complex, ever evolving, and there's not just one story to tell here. It's the native ground and homeland of the Massachusetts tribe, whose people still have a profound and spiritual connection with the land today. Colonial settlers also recognize the value of this place, ultimately seizing it for their own use. And those settlements later became home to Boston's early immigrant communities, forming the basis of the diverse neighborhoods that exist around the park today. In the late 1800s, the city acquired the land for Franklin Park's construction, despite opposition from its landowners. So try to place yourself in Boston over 100 years ago. It was an industrializing city. Its citizens were facing pretty harsh living conditions. And there were issues of sanitation, densely packed housing, the list goes on. Access to the city's small amount of park space was typically limited to those with an elite standing in society. So the idea of a linked system of parks spanning over 1,100 acres across Boston to provide access to everyone was not just progressive, it was actually quite radical. Of course, we're talking about the Emerald Necklace, but the terminus being Franklin Park, the city's largest park still today. One of the most prominent features of the site are the hilly formations or drumlins, which you're probably familiar with. It's just like the Harbor Islands. This land was shaped by receding glaciers millions of years ago. This topography would have been easily recognizable across the landscape of this area before it was developed. 
The hills and rocky outcrops in Franklin Park are an amazing reminder that there are so few places left in Boston where you can actually see the ground and imagine the forces that formed it. As Stephen mentioned, at the forefront of Olmsted's plan were principles of mental and physical health and the benefits of spending regular time outdoors. These ideals became physical with a simple but purposeful design with pleasing scenery, thoughtful location of program and activities, and the minimal interruption of the overall experience. This was done by expanding the woodlands to shape open meadows and frame views. Walking paths trace the undulations in the land, bringing visitors through low valleys into overlooks at higher elevations. Steps, walls, and architecture were constructed of that purpley Roxbury pudding stone that you see in the park today, which was harvested from a spot right next to Schoolmaster Hill. So the big takeaway here is really that each element was carefully selected and choreographed so that it would not distract from the power of this place. A feeling of continuous and unlimited space for all to experience was the goal. But beyond its initial construction, the park was never exactly realized as it was intended. There were differing attitudes about design, program, and ownership that resulted in some long-lasting changes in the park. The 1900 plan on the screen shows portions of the original design that got built in color and deviations from that plan in gray. And examples of those are like the introduction of the zoo or the golf course or widening uh, circuit drive to allow cars to travel, through, which divided the park in half. These changes are not just significant because they are different from the original design, but because they impact how people arrive, move through and experience the park and ultimately how people can come together and interact with each other. The neighborhoods around the park were also undergoing a lot of change. Many new people continued to move to the area, and by the middle of the century, Roxbury had become one of the most prominent Black communities in the Northeast. But practices of redlining and blockbusting impacted the neighborhoods around the park, and the city's upkeep and investment declined. What was once a symbol of public health and a shared resource had become a place of dangerous activity and a dumping ground. The story of how the park pivoted from this situation is really a true testament to the power of community leaders, many of who have been mentioned today, but people like Elma Lewis, the Franklin Park Coalition, and many others who self-organized, taking on every role there was to play. The legacy of their stewardship and action has influenced generations of community building and has inspired many of the cherished events that activate the park. While incremental changes have led to challenges in the park today, the strength of what remains speaks to the power of the land, the intelligence of the design, and the vigilant advocacy of the park's neighbors. We're hopeful that through conversations with you, the action plan can start to reestablish maybe some of what's been lost over, over the years and expand uh, the needs of visitors for the next 100 years and just to share even more stories. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Stephen for our first poll. Thanks, Lydia. So um, for folks joining uh, on Zoom, you can see the screen and um, I'll explain what we're about to do. For folks who are joining by phone, um, you can't see the screen, uh, but you can use the number that I'll give right now to actually engage and take the poll along with us. So the number that you will be text messaging to is the number that you were given earlier, 617. 799-2237. And I'll repeat that number if you miss it this time. Um, there are going to be four polls that we're going to take throughout this meeting. Uh, this will be the first of them. Um, so based on uh, Lydia's presentation and sort of um, overview of the history, um, now we want to know how the story of the park should be told in the landscape today, um, now that we have an opportunity to, um, to sort of make our mark. So what we want you to do is pick one or two of the options that I'm gonna read off and that you see on the screen. Um, and you'll be able to do that after I read through them. I'm gonna read through them quickly, then I'm gonna launch the poll for about a minute. Everyone will have a chance to select one or two options. If you're on the phone, you can just text the letter of the options that you're choosing. Um, and then we will record those and actually you'll be able to see in real time um, what the consensus was. So the question again is, how should the story of the park be told in the landscape today? 
pick one or two options. Option A, interpretive signage to tell stories. Option B, self-guided history walks. Option C, events that celebrate multiple cultures and histories. Option D, temporary art installations. Option E, rebuild or restore elements of the original park design. Or if you have another idea, option F, uh, if you select option F, you can then use the chat option to type in your idea that's not in this list. Or if you're text messaging and you select option F, you can type that into your text message. So I'm going to launch the poll now, and then you will be able to select your two top choices. And the question again is, how should the story of the park be told in the landscape today? For those on the phone, the number is 617-799-2237. And the options are A, interpretive signage to tell stories, B, self-guided history walks, C, events that celebrate multiple cultures, D, temporary art installations, E, rebuild or restore elements of the original park design, or F, something else. And if you select F, then go ahead and type that in the chat box um, on Zoom. Or if you're texting in by phone, go ahead and text your suggestion uh, along with your selection. <laughs> Okay, the poll's been open for one minute. I'm gonna give it just a few more seconds. If you're making your decision, uh, go ahead and do that now. You can select one or two options. And then I, I, when I close the poll, I'll share that back with everyone. You'll be able to see the results um, from everyone. Okay, I'm gonna give about 10 more seconds and then close the poll. All right, I'm closing the poll and sharing results. And it looks like um, many people on this call are interested in rebuilding or restoring elements from the original plan. Um, and then in second is events that celebrate multiple cultures. It's really a kind of a tie between those two. Uh, and then coming in a three-way tie for second place, temporary art installations, self-guided history walks, and interpretive signage. Uh, and then there were two people that did enter in suggestions in the chat, which we will record after this call. Um, Lauren, were there any folks on the phone that sent in anything? Yes, we had quite a few texts, actually. We had um, one vote for A, signage, three for B, history walks two for C events, two for D art, and five for um, re re rebuilding and restoring elements. Great. Um, so let's move on to the next part. Brie Hensold is going to present. Um, take it away, Brie. Thank you, Stephen, and thanks, everybody. Those are really interesting responses. I think um, very similar to what we saw at our earlier meeting today, but some differences. So it'll be interesting to combine them. Um, as Stephen said, I'm Bree Hensold. I'm a planner and a principal with Agency Landscape and Planning, and I'll be sharing some observations with you about community use, programming, and amenities in the park. One of our top priorities for this plan is making sure that any changes to Franklin Park strengthen what is already an important role and meaning that it has to neighbors and to the broader community. So let's start with a quick look at a little bit of what you all shared about your use of the park at the first public meeting. Um, and in the survey, we learned that Franklin Park is a community heart in large part uh, because it can provide such a wide range of choices for things to do. People today use the park to exercise, to stay in shape, but also to get together with friends and family, both in small gatherings like birthday parties or large events like BAMS Fest and the Caribbean Festival, among many others. At the same time, we heard that there is a clear need for better information and communication about park offerings, and that is the top thing that would draw more people to use the park more often. At the first community workshop, we had a large map in the room where people shared places in the park that you love, places that need improvement, and ideas for changes. Up on the screen now, you can see some comments which were repeated most often. Clearly, Franklin Park is a really well-loved place and people are invested in its future. 
Today, people love cir circuit drive for exercise. As John said, we've even observed that this pattern is thriving throughout COVID, um, and it's a really busy place for a daily walk. The eastern edge of the park is loved for its wild qualities, and all throughout, there are places for small recreational activities and major events. I will say also that we were already texted tonight a question about um, inquiring about the possibility of creating a dog park. Um, so it's worth mentioning that's something that came up as well during the first meeting and we'll be looking at it in the next phase as we explore a new proposal. So I suppose stay tuned on that front. Many of the issues that were reported to need the most improvement um, were circulation related issues like too narrow paths, unsafe crossings, and the potential to close roads to vehicular traffic. The community's analysis has really focused on understanding on one hand what the park offers to the community today and on the other hand what the community needs or is looking for. So this includes understanding the relationship of programs, special places, and amenities to what users of all ages, backgrounds, and relationships to the park want to do or hope to experience when they come into Franklin Park. Our hope with this action plan is to try to bring those two things closer together to better meet your needs. With Franklin Park's 500 uh, total acres, approximately 500 acres, just under 300 of those acres are open park space that are able to accommodate a wide range of experiences and activities. What you see on the screen is really an inventory of those different amenities um, in the park today. Playgrounds are generally, generally clustered near neighborhood entrances. Um, there's a variety of different sports and recreation destinations that are pretty well distributed across the park. Um, but overall, we do see that there's a cluster of many activities um, concentrated in the northern corner. Given the scale of the park and the distribution of entrances, the walkability of these different amenities varies greatly from side to side. From each entrance, you can see on these maps what activities can be reached in a 5, 10, 15, and even 20 minute walk. Although the limited paths through the center of the park somewhat cuts down on access across between those different amenities. In a way, you can see that this creates the effect of many small scale parks within the overall park boundaries. Historically, Franklin Park was home to many buildings throughout the park that served as destinations and provided important services like bathrooms or shelter. Over time, many of these buildings have gone away or become remnants so that today fewer of these services remain. Perhaps not surprisingly, you can see that our survey reported that bathrooms are the number one requested addition to the park. We also learned from the survey that events and small gatherings are major draws for visitors um, from all neighborhoods and of all ages. Many areas of the park can be, can be reserved for these different types of uses, giving us a picture of the more frequently used areas um, and more frequent activities. So what you see on the screen, if you look from left to right, um, is a sort of increasing range of um, most used and most reserved spaces. What this shows, shows us is that sports and picnic sites have the highest intensity of reserve use today. But on the other hand, we know that trails, playgrounds, and parking lots can't be accounted for in those reserved areas and host a lot of activity. All of this information, both formal and informal, tells us that the edges of the park are generally the most highly activated and programmed. One thing that's really striking when looking across the range of park activities is the seasonal, seasonal nature of use today. The vast majority of the activities, whether they're formal or informal, take place during the warmer summer months but the park really has its own beauty during winter time and fall as well. Can you imagine what might entice you to visit during Boston's colder months? I'm gonna pass this back to Stephen to take that question further. Thanks, Bree. Hey, Lydia, can we go back to that slide that shows the, the programming and events? Um, I just think it's super interesting to, to look at this and see, no, the, the one after this. If you see this, this, the zone between April and September, it's really where most of the activity, most of the programming is happening. Um, and, uh, but when we took the survey, you know, over 6,000 people responded, roughly a third of the people who responded actually said that they go to the park in the winter months. And so, you know, we're really curious to know um, what's bringing you to the park and what would bring more people to the park in those cold weather months. So if we go to the next slide, um, that's uh, really gonna be the question. So um, again, for those who are on the phone, the number to text your answer is 617-799-2237, same as before. Um, and the question today uh, for this section is, what would bring you to Franklin Park in February? Um, again, you're gonna pick one or two answers. 
I'll read these out. Um, they each have a letter associated with them. Uh, so if you're voting by text, um, you can just text the letter. Um, and if you're voting on, uh, on Zoom, um, I'll open up the poll and we can look at that uh, after I read through these. So what would bring you to Franklin Park in February? Pick one or two. A, winter concerts, special events or festivals. B, partnerships with youth education programs. C, outdoor winter recreation, including skiing or snowshoe rentals. D, access to indoor spaces with bathrooms and vendors and warming zones. E, indoor spaces for small gatherings with friends and family. Or F, something else that's not on this list. So I'm going to launch this poll. So the poll is launched. We'll leave this open for about a minute. I'll read these again for those who are on the phone. Again, select one or two of these uh, options. So the question is, what would bring you to Franklin Park in February? Pick one or two. A, winter concerts, special events, or festivals. B, partnerships for youth education programs. C, outdoor winter recreation, including skiing, snowshoe rentals, and other winter activities. D, access to indoor spaces with bathrooms and vendors and warming zones. E, indoor spaces for small gatherings with friends and family. Or F, something else. And if you have a suggestion for something else, go ahead and type that into the chat on Zoom or send that via text to 617-799-2237. Uh, we had roughly 68 people out of the 92 attendees that responded to the first poll. Um, we've got 67 that have responded to this one, so it's roughly the same. So I'm going to close this poll uh, in about 10 seconds. Now we're up to 70. So if, you, if you'd like to make your selection, go ahead and do so. All right, I'm going to end this poll and share the results back with you. So it looks like we kind of have a tie between C, outdoor winter recreation, including skiing and snowshoe rentals, and winter concerts, special events, and festivals. And if I recall from the noon meeting, um, that was the same tie that we had and in that order. Um, and then access to, to indoor spaces with the bathroom vendors and warming zones, I think was also uh, came in third in this kind of way. So um, it sounds like there's some, some consistency even from the people who attended uh, earlier in the day. Uh, Lauren, did you get these uh, same readouts from the phone or are they a little bit different? They're very similar actually. Um, the one thing that um, did show up a little bit more with youth programming, maybe a little bit more than your 10%. Um, and also someone chatted in an answer um, for fenced dog parks as, um, an, as an alternative. Awesome. So, you know, one thing also that Bree mentioned um, earlier was the, the way in which, depending on where you live along the edge of the park, your experience of walking five, 10 or 15 minutes is very different. And so the park that the, the area that you have sort of the closest adjacency to and most access to um, might be different from someone else in another zip code um, or someone else with a differing ability based upon their age. And so um, what we wanna do now is do a couple of uh, quick demographic polls just to get a sense of uh, who's in attendance and so we can better understand and parse the information and feedback that we're getting. So this first one is going to be to tell us which zip code you live in. And for those on the phone, the, the number is the same to text. Option A is 02119. Option B is 02121. Option C is 02124. Option D is 02130. Option E is 02131. And uh, option F would be for you to type your zip code into the chat or text message if it's not listed there. So again, A, 02119, B is 02121, C is 02124, D is 02130, E is 02131, and F is a zip code if it's not listed here. 
Um, we've got about 64 people out of 92, 65 who've responded. I'll leave this open for about 10 more seconds. All right, I'm going to end this poll and share the results. Uh, so 02130 has the largest representation um, by far. Uh, Lauren, was that the same for you? Yes, it was. All right. Um, and all of this uh, data about who attended will be available publicly um, for the next um, engagement that we have. So don't worry if you are trying to hurry up and write this down, you'll get this information. Uh, the next is um, another quick poll where we want to ask what is your race or ethnic uh, identity that you identify with? Um, A, Black or African American. B, American Indian and Alaska Native. C, Asian. D, Caucasian or white. E, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. F, Hispanic or Latino. Uh, G, prefer not to say. H, other, and then you can type that into the chat or type that as a text. Um, these are the, the same um, breakdown in categories that we've used uh, earlier in this engagement process. So this allows us to kind of track that engagement. So again, A, Black, African American, B, American Indian, Alaska Native, C, Asian, D, Caucasian, White, E, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, F, Hispanic or Latino, G, prefer not to say, or H, another designation that you can write into the chat or send it via text message. Uh, we've got 67 out of 92 people uh, who have selected. And so I'm gonna end this poll in about five seconds. So submit now if you are. All right, ending the poll, sharing the results. Uh, we have 64% um, white Caucasian, followed by 19% black African American, um, and then Asian and Hispanic Latino uh, are roughly tied for seven to nine percent. So we've got one more of these demographic asks. I'm going to stop sharing this. This is the last of these. And this is asking about age. Um, so what is your age range? A, zero to 18, obviously not zero. <laughs> B, 19 to 39. C, 40 to 59. D, 60 to 79. Or E, over 80. So for those texting by phone, option A, um, uh, under 18. Option B, 19 to 39. Option C, 40 to 59, option D, 60 to 79, and option E, over 80. And we have 66 out of 92 who have participated, which is roughly the same as the other polls. So I'm gonna end this in about uh, five seconds. All right, ending this poll now. Sharing the results. Um, and it looks like most people are in their 20s or 30s, uh, followed closely by people in their 40s and 50s, and then 60s and 70s. Um, we have one person who's under 18, so thank you for joining. Uh, Lauren, how did those track with people on the phone? Um, with uh, just, oh, sorry, I just got a late, um, late answer coming in. Um, so we actually had um, more um, 19 to 39 year olds. We had 75 percent um, 19 to 39 year olds and 25 percent in the 40 to 59 category. And in terms of the race and ethnicity, um, we had um, 33 percent um, Black or African American and um, 67 percent uh, D, Caucasian. So a little different than what you had. All right. 
Great. Well, we'll record this and um, and we will have two more polls for the next two sections, but we just wanted to make sure that we got the demographic information kind of in the middle of the meeting when most people would still be on. So um, take it away, Jenny. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so great evening, everyone. My name is Jadine Williams, and I'm the project manager for Mass Design Group. I'll be walking you through some of our observations related to connections to the park. Based on what we've heard from you all over the past several months, we've identified a number of physical and social barriers that limit people's access or perceived access to the park. We realize that if these barriers aren't solved for in this action plan, the other efforts we manage to design more inclusive programming, restore ecologies, and create more welcoming spaces inside the park will be for nothing. Through our survey and workshop, we learned that 75% of respondents arrive by car, suggesting that maybe better pedestrian and bike connections need to be explored. The park must first and foremost serve its surrounding neighborhoods but the opportunity exists to welcome regional communities and visitors to connect with a landscape unlike anywhere else in the city. It's within a 10 minute walk from T lines that service more distant neighborhoods like Quincy and Somerville, as well as many major bus lines to neighborhoods throughout the city. However, inadequate signage and wayfinding to guide visitors to the park, as well as poorly designed and maintained bus stops and street crossings limit access to a broad group of visitors. An examination of edges, beginning with the physical perimeter and extending into the park and surrounding neighborhoods, reveals where better access and visibility can welcome all users. There are five faces to the park, each of which have distinct challenges and opportunities to welcome pedestrians and cyclists from adjacent neighborhoods. Many elements originally intended to protect the park from the city now feel like barriers, which are often intensified by the busy traffic. When we dove into the conditions along the edges of the park, we realized how imbalanced the connections and barriers actually were. For example, the Jamaica Plain Edge feels very public and has multiple pedestrian crossings and entrances, but sometimes can feel a little disorienting upon arrival because of the dense and continuous canopy. And along Seaver Street, a lot of the edge is privatized and fenced off because of the zoo and the sidewalk is inconsistent, making this space feel a little unapproachable. Other barriers observed include heavy traffic and few crossings that limit the opportunity to bridge the commercial corridor of Blue Hill Avenue to the park and the low visibility entrances along American Legion Highway. These barriers exist partly because Olmsted's original design was intended to create a separation between nature and the city, but have been intensified because of urban growth and changes in management over time. The action plan will address these conditions and work to create more balanced multimodal access to the park from all sides. Vehicular traffic not only rings the park's outer edges, it also bisects the interior. Circuit drive and dispersed parking facility, excuse me, dispersed parking facilitate access and service for a significant portion of users and programs. But its adaptation as a through street came at the cross of pedestrian wayfinding and circulation clarity. Important moments of orientation and arrival, such as the valley gates and Peabody Circle, are now a complicated system of paths, drives, and parking. The majority of parking is informal, unmarked, or unregulated, which leads to inefficiencies that decrease available spaces. Fast traffic and parking create boundaries between major open spaces within the park. Improving these pedestrian connections across and along the road can improve access and safety for pedestrians, cyclists, and motorists alike. Built features from the original park design, such as walls, steps, and overlooks, were meant to guide access and cur curate a visitor experience of the park landscape. In response to changes in use and program, incre incremental solutions meant to control vehicles, restrict access, and improve safety now form barriers and edges throughout the park. The original circulation design was carefully calibrated to offer a clear and immersive experience of the landscapes across the park. A clear hierarchy of path widths and materials served as important cues for movement and wayfinding throughout the park. But today, arbitrary and abrupt changes in width and material obscure the intuitive system of loops and circuits of the original network. Reinstating a clear hierarchy to guide circulation is critical to restoring a cohesive park experience. Currently, the majority of signs focus on rules and regulations 
while few exist to help visitors interpret and understand the park's historic significance. Improved signage will serve as an important educational purpose, teaching visitors about their surroundings and indicating important landmarks while keeping them safe in their surroundings. And with that, I'll pass it back to Stephen for another poll related to your perceived barriers. Thank you, Jadi. Um, so as with the other two polls that we did uh, from the other sections, folks uh, that are gonna be texting by phone, the number is the same as before, 617-799-2237. And for those who are joining us by Zoom, um, you will have a poll that's gonna pop up momentarily. The question for this section is, what are the primary barriers to you entering or fully enjoying the park? Again, you're gonna select one or two answers uh, that you feel best answer the question. Um, so A, feeling unsafe because of traffic on Circuit Drive. B, lack of entrances on my side of the park. C, dense understory of vegetation, so too many shrubs and bushes on the ground. D, confusing and disconnected path systems. E, unwelcoming spaces, um, and tell us more in the chat if you select E. F, lack of awareness about the park um, or how to get there. G, difficulty finding parking. Or H, something else, which you can write into the chat or send in a text um, manually. So I'm gonna launch this poll right now. We'll have about one minute. Uh, let's see. Connections, launching the poll now. Uh, and for those on the phone, I'll read out the options again. So the question is, uh, what are the primary barriers to you entering or fully enjoying the park? Pick one or two. A, feeling unsafe because of traffic on Circuit Drive. B, lack of entrances on my side of the park. C, dense understory of vegetation, uh, bushes and shrubs. D, confusing and disconnected path systems. E, unwelcoming spaces. Um, again, tell us more in the chat or by text. F, lack of awareness about the park or how to get there. G, difficulty finding parking. Or H, something else that you can tell us about either by texting it uh, or by uh, writing it in the chat. And I'm gonna close the poll in about maybe 15 seconds because it seems like people are taking a little bit more time to decide. All right, we're up to almost 60 people who have submitted their answers uh, via Zoom. All right, we're just over 60 answers. I'm gonna close the poll in about five to seven seconds. So go ahead and hit submit if you've made a selection. All right, I'm ending the poll now and sharing the results. Uh, so it looks like 46%, um, so 28 out of 61 people who uh, voted this time thought that confusing and disconnected path systems um, were uh, the top barrier for them coming in and enjoying the park, uh, followed by 34% feeling unsafe because of traffic on Circuit Drive. Um, and then 23% uh, had suggestions of other things. And there seems to be a general tie between 11 and 15% for lack of entrances on my side of the park, dense understory of vegetation, um, unwelcoming spaces, lack of awareness about the park and how to get, get to it, um, and difficulty finding parking. Uh, so these seem to track pretty closely, actually. The confusing disconnected path system was um, the top in the afternoon meeting as well. How did these fare for you, Lauren? So these were a little different on our end with the text. 50% um, of the votes came in for feeling unsafe. Although one person clarified that the unsafe feeling was due to dogs being off leash, not necessarily circuit drive. And then we had one vote each for um, the dense understory um, 
the confusing path system and unwelcoming spaces. All right. And also comments about um, motorized bicycles on pedestrian pathways. All right, so these comments and feedback are noted and uh, now we'll move to the last part of the presentation. We'll have one more poll for you um, after this part of the presentation and then we'll move into the Q&A. I'm gonna take a quick 20 or 30 second pause for the interpreters and then we'll jump into ecology. Okay, great. Um, I'm Kristen Fredrickson, a landscape architect and associate principal with Reed Hildebrand, and I'll be taking you through some of the highlights of our ecology analysis. If you wanna see the rest of the work, please visit the plan um, website. We heard from you how important the park is as a place to be in nature, how many different things you do in the park's landscapes and ways that they could do more, like teaching people about plants. Many of of us on the design team came to our careers because of our own deeply felt experiences of being in nature. We recognize how powerful and how tied to family and friends those experiences are. So thank you so much for sharing your stories. At 485 acres, Franklin Park is by far the largest green space in the city of Boston and part of a larger reason, regional system of open space to home to lots of different people, plants and animals. The plan of the park's ecological types, where each color represents a different habitat, brings home the incredible variety within the park boundary. We know that what you see above ground is a reflection of what's happening below ground, that the life of the soil is intrinsically connected to the life of the vegetation it supports. The important takeaway is that healthy plants rely on healthy soils, so we're looking closely at those relationships. Lydia talked about the land that pre-existed the park, the continuum of alteration over time, some at the scale of a glacier and some at the scale of many different human hands. She also described the way Olmsted's design represented a careful reading of the land and amplification of its many landscapes. We've broken that mosaic into pieces to highlight the many different ecotypes within the park. This ecological richness results in a visual, experiential, and programmatic richness, which we feel is critical to maintain. We're looking closely at the existing health of each of these types, the pressures on them, and what kind of support they need to ensure they're, they're here for future generations to experience. As Bree said, these landscapes also support an incredible range of activities, small and large, regular and intermittent, for young and old. Like the relationship between soil and plant life, there's a direct relationship between intensity of use and the health or resiliency of these landscapes. So as we're looking at ways to better support existing activities, as well as adding new, we're also looking at how to balance the programmatic needs with the health of the natural systems. We recognize that all that use and the large vegetated acreage requires extensive management. At the moment, there are only three full-time crew caring for the park's acreage that is managed by Parks Department. Part of our work will be to outline short and long-term management goals, as well as opportunities to expand maintenance teams. At their healthiest, ecologies are self-sustaining. That cycle always includes management of some kind. Animals and insects do work, people do work, weather does work. If those cycles of management don't exist or are out of balance or overwhelmed by things like invasive plants or the wear and tear of heavy use, the system and the landscape starts to unravel. In the woodlands, years of almost no active management, things like selective tree clearing to allow space for seeds to become the healthy next generation of trees means that the woodlands are largely a single age canopy. There's no reliable next generation, there's less plant diversity than there should be, and people feel unsafe because the mid-story is impenetrable when it leaves. Our goal is to establish both immediate and long-term management strategies, which would over time return the woodland to something closer to self-management. A lot of work in the near term, less work in the long term. This would both, sorry, excuse me, this would include both active removals of unwanted material, strategic planting, and most importantly, reestablishing cycles of natural renewal so the woodlands are growing their own plants. 
This would be matched with diverse but carefully incorporated programming so neighbors and visitors can safely and fully experience the incredible range of plants and animals these woodlands can support. And then there are the elders within the tree canopy. Heritage trees are scattered throughout the park. To have a place in the heart of the city with this number of mature trees, some 200 years old or older, is just incredible. They have been witness to all of the changes we've discussed. They're also just incredibly beautiful. But they are old and they need specific and strategic support to endure. We'll be looking closely at these and setting priorities for support. Open spaces or grasslands are some of the most important and heavily used areas in the park. Low in plant and animal diversity, but high in flexibility for multiple uses at multiple scales, mown lawns are critical to park offerings. Perhaps here, more than any other planted place, the park is literally being loved to death. Compaction from heavy use and management systems that can't keep up with mitigation strategies mean that the spaces aren't always reliable. Lawn becomes dirt, low places hold water in storm. Next, looking at cycles of use and establishing more robust mitigating management will improve durability. Counteracting compaction issues will improve soil's resilience, both for growing grass and to operate as a sponge for stormwater. Seeding pollinator loving plants and designing edges to be mown much less regularly will increase healthy habitats and provide new interest. We know that Boston is an old city and as such includes areas of aging infrastructure. This includes the structured drainage within the park. Pipes are understaged for today's increased precipitation and expansive impermeable surf surfaces and all water leads to the harbor, taking its pollutants with it. The park map shows that most of the park's acreage, the area in blue, sends its stormwater to the piped drainage system, straining capacity. An open space with the acreage and naturally undulating topography of the park is primed to do more to protect downstream neighbors from flooding and our natural waters from the pollutants associated with contemporary life. What we recognize in our work on ecologies, but also in our analysis in general, is the important interconnectivity that is viscerally present in the park on so many levels. As John said, the landscapes in the park are providing not only ecosystem and cultural or programmatic services, but critical climate resiliency and public health services. Our proposals will understand the work they're doing and what support is needed for them to continue that work of protecting all of us, especially the park's neighbors as well as just being very beautiful places to make new memories. Stephen's gonna take us to the last poll now. All right, thank you, Kristen. This is the last poll uh, of the meeting. And um, for those on the phone, the phone number is the same to text your answers. It's 617-799-2237, same as before. Uh, the question at the end of this section is, um, what would encourage you to explore areas of the park that might be unfamiliar to you? Again, you'll pick one or two of these uh, answers as yours. Um, A, clearly marked trails to outlooks and views. B, signage that highlights park offerings and activities. C, better maintained vegetation. D, seasonal displays of fall color and flowering trees. E, presence of park rangers. F, educational programming and trails, or G, something else that you'd like to write in the chat or send by text. So I'm gonna launch the poll now for about a minute. Poll is launched. The question again for those on the phone is, what would encourage you to explore areas of the park that might be unfamiliar to you? Pick one or two. A, clearly marked trails to outlooks and views. B, signage that highlights park offerings and activities. C, better maintained vegetation. D, seasonal displays of fall color or flowering trees. E, presence of park rangers. F, educational programming and trails. Or G, something else altogether that you can text in, or if you're on the Zoom call, you can write it into the chat window. So I'll leave this open for about 10 more seconds. It looks like we have 63 people who have responded so far, 65 now. So people are still kind of trailing in a little bit. We'll give it another few more seconds before we close the poll and share the results.
All right, I'm going to end the poll now. If you've got something you want to submit, go ahead and submit it. I saw two just come in right now. So if there's anyone else, go ahead and hit submit. And ending the poll. So it looks like the answer to the question, um, what would encourage you to explore areas of the park that might be unfamiliar to you? Um, A seems to be the clear winner with 68%. So 46 out of 68 people um, chose clearly marked trails to outlooks and views. So again, this idea of paths and wayfinding um, seems to be a common theme. Um, followed by uh, signage that highlights park offerings with 37% of people answering that way, followed by a kind of a tie between educational programs and trails with 26% and better maintained vegetation with 25%. Um, and then seasonal displays of fall uh, color and flowering trees with 24%. It's kind of a three-way tie. Um, and not many people were interested in the presence of park rangers. Um, Lauren, how did that fare with what you got on the phone? Yeah, so it's fairly similar. Um, a, B, and C each had three or four votes each. Rangers had two, um, and education and seasonal um, plantings each had one. And one of the comments that came in, which I think is maybe telling with what um, you were seeing with lower numbers on the Rangers, was one of the comments was that um, rangers are like police and don't make me feel safe. So that that could be partially what um, you're seeing with the lower numbers on this end as well. All right. Well, thank you. I'm going to stop sharing this poll now. And I think we have a few more updates before we open up to Q&A. Thanks, Stephen. And thanks to everyone for sharing your ideas. Um, I'm aware of the time here. In all fairness, I did warn you that there was a lot of information that we were going to go through today. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about the pro draft project principles. As the team completes the analysis phase of the project and we begin to refocus our energy toward visioning and design, we're sharing with you a draft of what we're calling project principles. These will form the foundation of our work moving forward. They've been developed in conjunction with your feedback in its many forms as well as with the team's findings. You probably have some questions about these, like how will they be used? Uh, the beginning of the next phase is really about testing actions and ideas that are rooted in the things we've learned so far. So ultimately these shared principles will help us stay true to what we think is important for the future of the park and the things we want to achieve together. These will become deeper and more specific through testing and design study in the upcoming phase. You also might think of something that you don't see included here. And we want you to be able to take some time to review these on our website and respond to the second mini poll with any feedback that you have. The poll will be open through early August and we'll share the results, including an updated version of these principles to reflect what we've heard. While we're together here, I wanna quickly run through each of these briefly to provide a little more context. So the first project principle is to recognize history and broaden potential. I'm not going to read each one of these. Uh, I'll let you read them. But as Lydia described, the park is a historic site and its history needs to be engaged. But it also needs to tell more stories. And so that's what this principle is about. We want to build on the things that exist here and adapt them to our current needs. Um, and we know that we need to expand the voices represented and tell a more comprehensive history of this place and its stewards. The second principle is to reach out and welcome in. As Jadi shared, the original park boundary has intensified and impacted connections with the surrounding neighborhoods. The park and its edges and entrances should be inviting and easy to access and safe and welcoming for all. We know we have to make it safer and easier to get here. Um, and we have to do a better job of letting people know what is here and how to get to it. The third principle is to break down barriers to promote a unified experience. Franklin Park is really unique from smaller neighborhood parks, but the large park experience has been undermined over time by changes uh, to the park's fabric. There are things we can do to restore a sense of unlimited space that is safe to explore. And we saw that in some of the responses today. We need to hold on to what remains of the park fabric and knit it back together more strongly. Um, 
We need to make it easier to get around and more inviting to explore, as that last poll just described. And we need to reimagine Circuit Drive as a multimodal space that prioritizes the pedestrian experience. The fourth principle is to enhance diversity and support longevity. Kristen highlighted how the park's landscape provides essential ecological, mental, and physical health and exper experiential benefits, but that, that we have to care for that in order to ensure sustainable and healthy ecosystems that support diversity, programming, and safety. Um, that means thinking about the long game here, as well as short-term things that can make a difference and thinking outside the box about how we integrate those strategies with the existing fabric of the park. The fifth principle uh, is to support existing assets and expand park offerings. Bree's presentation pointed out that the park provides a variety of programming today, but it also lacks the essential resources needed to fully support the existing activities. Um, in order to do that, we need to think about comfort we need to think about flexibility, and we need to think about how we balance the active and passive demands of programming on the park. And the sixth principle is to guide responsible investment to catalyze long-term benefit. As Commissioner Woods described, with the dedicated funding for improvements, priorities identified in this plan must be clear, strategic, and reflective of the community's desires but also balance the realities of caring for a park of this size. The city recognizes the need to build local capacity, partners and stewards to help champion the future of the park and to bring positive and equitable impact to its existing communities. I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Um, before we transition to the q and I just wanna revisit some of the ways you can continue to engage with the Franklin Park Action Plan. And we help, we ask for your help in spreading the word on this. Um, like I've said a couple of times after today's presentation, we'll be launching a mini poll to gather your thoughts on these draft principles for the project, which should only take a couple of minutes to complete. And we really appreciate your uh, commitment to doing that. Um, you can find these mini polls on the website at franklinparkactionplan.com. Over the next couple of weeks, as I described earlier, you can sign up to participate in the theme discussion groups to dig deeper into the four analysis topics we'll be sharing today. And again, this gives you a chance for more conversation and discussion, uh, which we know there isn't availability for in the format uh, today. Um, so with that, um, I want to uh, pass this on to Lauren and Ree for the Q&A and to thank you all for your uh, commitment to Franklin Park and to showing up tonight and spending all this time with us. Thank you, John. Um, we've had a lot of great questions come in during the presentation so far, and I just wanted to remind people who haven't been able to ask a question yet how they can do that. For those logged into Zoom, you can type your questions into the Q&A box and let us know if you'd like to ask the question in person. Um, we can unmute you when we get to your question. For those on the phone, you've got two options. You can press star nine, which will alert all of us that you want to speak, um, and we can unmute you, or you guys can continue to text your questions to 617-799-2237. Um, and as we get into the questions, we just wanted to set out a couple of guidelines for our conversation that can be helpful. Um, I know it's sometimes hard when we can't see each other's faces, so just wanna remind everybody to please be respectful and use respectful language, share airtime so everyone gets a chance to be heard, and please try to limit to one question into about one minute. Um, so now let's go ahead and get into the questions. Um, Reed, do you want to assign the first one to a, a panelist? Sure thing. Um, the, I think we, did we also suggest that maybe we could have um, people if they're interested to ask the questions themselves? Okay. Yes, they can. Okay, great. Um, the first question is for Kristen from Reed Hildebrand and it comes from um, someone by the name of Justine Hansen. Um, Justine, we've allowed you to talk if you want to go ahead and ask the question yourself. Otherwise, we're happy to do it for you. Okay, I'll go ahead and, and ask the question. Um, the question from Justine asks, will wildlife habitat and biodiversity be included to the focus on landscape and vegetation? Sorry. 
Um, she's thinking that um, Franklin Park is an important migratory stopover location for many threatened um, neotropical migrant birds and a home to many year-round resident birds and other wildlife. It's also an incredible opportunity for community science initiatives. I'll turn that over to you, Kristen. Great, thanks. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I hope the slides that we went through began to answer it, but yes, absolutely. We are um, really focused on how um, management in, in any of these many landscapes will both improve the ability for visitors to um, visit and learn about them, but also for all of the plants, animals, insects, et cetera, that live here to become um, more diverse. So we have an ecologist um, as part of our team, we have an arborist as part of our team, and we'll be working closely with both of them as we go through the various proposals about um, to make sure that any kind of changes um, are not decreasing diversity, instead um, improving it. And if you have any other ideas that you um, about that, we'd love to hear them if you want to um, send them in or um, join our ecology breakout session. It would be great to hear what you know and what you love about the park. Um, and we agree entirely about the opportunity for um, eco education or just really learning more about these landscapes if for teachers and for students or for people who just live in the community and we are thinking about ways that um, easy ways like um, more signage about what plants are what um, in the woodlands and um, maybe ways that are a little bit more in depth around um, pamphlets or um, or guides that would allow you and your family and your friends to go and do sort of walks to see and learn about what's in the um, what's in the woodlands or what lives in Scarborough Pond. Again, if you have any ideas, we'd love to love to hear them. So thanks for the question. Thank you, Kristen. Our next question comes from Vincent. So I'm going to allow you to unmute. Oh, actually, Vincent just seemed to have left. So I'll go ahead and ask the question so that we can have it um, recorded as an answer. Um, this question is going to go to Bree. The question is, will responses be weighted by race to reflect the demographics of the surrounding communities? And I'm assuming they mean um, the responses of the polls. Yes, um, thank you to uh, Vincent and I guess goodbye to Vincent also, also but hopefully this is helpful to everybody. Um, so it's something we think a lot about because I think everybody, you know, really wants this plan to be impactful and meaningful to the neighbors and to the surrounding communities. And so want to make sure that what we're hearing and what we're integrating is representative and that's true, um, both in terms of you know, understanding race of responses and of communities, but also age, um, you know, families with children or older adults, what are specific needs. And so we've looked carefully at, at demographics of the, of the neighborhoods. And then we've looked also at, um, when possible, the demographics of the um, responses that we're getting both to the poll here today. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about how we'll use that, but also in the past um, on the survey. And so actually initially when we put the survey out, um, I think Stephen might have alluded to this, the responses we got, we looked at and they didn't particularly in terms of race represent the surrounding neighborhoods. And so with the help of the Franklin Park Coalition, a lot of help from them and others, um, we were able to extend that survey and get um, what was a closer to representative um, uh, response rate uh, when it came to race and other demographics. So we'll use this in input in two ways. We'll take a look and see where um, where the demographics of these meetings do and don't match up um, with the neighborhoods. And then we'll say, well, that means we probably need to do a concerted effort to do more outreach to these communities. Can we talk to certain organizations? Can we um, use social media? Can we um, think about some youth engagement to do? And so we'll use it to target our next steps of engagement and try to broaden and get more representative responses. But then also, um, I would say in a very unscientific way, we will, um, factor in and kind of weight the differentiation between who we're hearing from and who we know is in the community and try to make sure that we're also um, considering the voices that we're not hearing. Hey, Bree. Uh, this is Rhiannon again, and apologies to everyone for not introducing myself before. My name is Rhiannon, and I'm an urban planner, um, and I work for Agency Landscape and Planning with Bree. Um, 
The next question is from Amy Sales. And I'm not seeing Amy in our list. Um, so I'll go ahead and ask this question. Um, this question is going to be for Lydia. Uh, Lydia Cook with Reed Hildebrand. What is the difference between a legacy and a heritage tree? Thanks, Ree. That's a really great um, that's a really great question, and it's kind of a technical term, so I'm glad someone asked. Uh, basically, a heritage tree is is a term that's used to describe a specimen a tree that's typically very large of a certain size. It can also be a grouping of trees. And these trees are considered to have kind of unique value. They're considered irreplaceable in the park. So um, it can be things like age, rarity, size, the aesthetics that they bring to um, a park experience, ecological, historical value, those kinds of things. Um, so in terms of size, the way that we're measuring them on the diagram that you saw, which is um, pretty standard in terms of how you identify heritage and legacy trees is, is by uh, the diameter of the trunk. So um, heritage trees are 33 inches in diameter or larger and legacy trees are 48 inches in diameter or larger. Um, and as Kristen talked about, um, there's a lot of heritage and legacy trees in the park, which is fantastic. And, um, you know, we think it's really important to make sure that their, their legacy and, um, and their health is supported. Thank you, Lydia. Um, I think I, I'll go ahead and ask the next question, which are actually, Debbie, do you want to go ahead and ask the next question that was yours? Um, I've allowed you to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask it yourself. Yeah, um, I'm concerned about the amount of asphalt that's been put into the park in recent years. It's very polluting as it goes into the waterway and it also increases the temperature. And I've noticed when there was a section of Franklin Park that was asphalt, of, uh, I'm sorry, Scarborough Pond that was asphalted, that there were a lot of trees that died all of a sudden. So I'm wondering, you're talking about a lot more paths, I think. Um, I, I'm older and I appreciate the dirt paths, even though they've become harder for me, but I'm concerned about the asphalting of the park. So I, I can try to answer some of that question and I apologize uh, as well as Rhea, I didn't introduce myself either. I'm Lauren Bryant and I'm the project manager for Boston Parks for the Franklin Park Action Plan. And I know I've gotten to meet a lot of you over the years working on the Pathways Projects, the American Legion Playground and several other projects that I've worked on in Franklin Park. Um, my understanding with the asphalt pathways um, from the work that I've done is that it is something that the Boston Landmarks Commission has approved for us. Um, the concern that they have is that adding concrete um, feels more urban and more sidewalk setting and doesn't fit in with the more passive landscape of a country park historically with um, Franklin Park, although historically we would have had the gravel or stone dust pathways which can't, um, which don't meet ADA. So it's a, it's, it's the discrepancy between um, meeting ADA and what landmarks would not like us to use. And also ADA likes asphalt instead of the concrete um, better as well in terms of the joints. So that's why we had done that in the past. And in terms of whether we'll continue to do that, I think that'll be part of what we study with this plan. Um, and in terms of the concern with the trees surrounding um, Scarborough Pond, they're actually, the trees that died around Scarborough Pond actually had been damaged for quite some time. And part of the reason they had been damaged was all of the flooding as you, as I'm sure you've seen, that was around Scarborough Pond. It's part of the reason that when we repaved those pathways, we actually regraded the pathways and raised the grade so that all the flooding wasn't in the pathways as well. Um, so the damage that had been done to the trees that we lost was unfortunately due to feet and feet of water. Um, that had um, been about. pooling around the trees. I, I'm talking about not right on the pond, but be, behind going towards on the tennis court side uh, where it was asphalted. I don't understand the thing about asphalt is not urban. You can't get much more urban than asphalt. No, they were saying the concrete felt more urban. 
the concrete felt more like sidewalks that should be in a city next to large buildings as opposed to a country park. Get a grip. At, there's nothing more urban than asphalt. <laughs> Lauren, maybe you could also um, just briefly define ADA for people that aren't familiar with that term. Sure, it's American with Disabilities Act, and it's in order to provide a, the, the part of ADA that we're talking about is providing a smooth um, surface that is um, easier for um, persons with disabilities, whether they be in a wheelchair with a cane, um, a walker, um, makes easier for them to navigate um, a paved pathway. All right, thank you, Debbie, and thank you, um, Lauren. We, our next question is, um, this is Rhiannon again, this next question is for Bree, um, and this question comes from Linda Wells. See, Linda, I'm allowing you to talk, um, so now I think you just have to unmute yourself, and you can ask your question about um, educational programming, if you're prepared. My, uh, my question was about um, if you were to use or have a, a greater presence of park rangers, would they be serving the same purpose as they do in places like the Boston Harbor Islands, where when you see the park rangers, you know the park rangers are there because they're offering tours, giving you information, just as if you were on the Freedom Trail. If their purpose is just to be present and make people feel scary, um doesn't it doesn't provide the same welcoming environment as they do in other um, parks around the city that was my question thank you linda yeah i think it was a a question and an idea for the design team too um and i think really interesting for us to think about the idea of kind of transforming the role of park rangers um, into something that is more educational based, um, community based. Um, and there's some really good precedents for that, like you said, the Harbor Islands, as well as, um, you know, one piece of study that we haven't shared tonight, um, because it's still in process is we're looking at a lot of other large parks, um, like Franklin Park across the country and how they, the types of programming they do, how they use park rangers or volunteers um, in different ways and have different programs. So we're gonna be bringing in some of those ideas and sharing those back. So I think there's, there's a real possibility and potential for a program like that to be kind of grown and nurtured. And we'll just have to think about, um, you know, how that's done and what the role is um, and how that works within the kind of maintenance and operations. But it's a, it's a good idea for us to explore in the next phase. Yes, and historically there was a youth, there were ecological groups of youth that would come to do classes mm -hmm. around the park. Um, when I worked for the Franklin Park Coalition, there were youth groups there on a regular basis. And I know that LEA project, when they first started, they focused on uh, environmental and ecological classes. Yeah, so some of those things could be kind of blended together with the information that the rangers have too, you're right. And I think the, um, in our conversations with the Emerald Necklace Conservancy, I think they're still doing some of that environmental programming um, with teens and others. So yeah, there's a lot of, um, you know, one of the things we've talked about and the surveys bore this out too, sometimes information isn't getting out there in the right way um, to let people know about what programs are possible are exist. And that's another role that the Rangers could play is, you know, really just to be kind of um, broadcasting um, what's in the park. Thank you, lots of good ideas there. Thank you, and our next question comes from Emily Procknell. Sorry if I um, didn't pronounce that correctly. Emily, I'm going to unmute, I'm gonna allow you to unmute yourself in case you would like to, um, in case you'd like to ask that question yourself. Thanks, Lauren, and thank you, everyone. Um, this has been great. I was just curious, um, obviously parks are essential for young people. We know that they use the playgrounds and recreational areas, and given the um, current you know, conditions that we're all under with the um, COVID-19 pandemic and folks having to 
kind of come up with creative ways to get, you know, young people outdoors and, and engaging with nature, how will you all be able to solicit ideas from youth and children about what they want to see in the park, um, given that their input is important, but that they might not participate in a Zoom call and we're kind of restricted in how we can gather for community meetings? Bree, is that something you can answer for us? Sure, yes, I'm happy to. Um, yes, Emily, I think um, youth often have really good ideas that we haven't thought about before. Um, they often don't have, you know, a lot of the same kind of um, restrictions that I think some of us bring who are, you know, thinking about these every day. So we love doing youth engagement. And at the beginning of the process before COVID, we were able to do some of that. Um, we've had a series of pop-ups um, that we we went to um, the turkey trots um, did some events at the um, at the park as well and then also participated in the tree lighting and so with that we brought along a kind of mobile um, activity station and we had a lot of kids participate in that as well as their parents and others too it wasn't wasn't limited but that was really fun to get youth participation and input at that point i think we we're we were all really looking forward to a summer of pop-ups in the park and engagement activities with more youth where we could do that. Um, and that obviously has been a lot harder too, especially as summer camps have, um, you know, had to make changes in their plans. Um, so we've started to have some discussions um, with the Eggleston Square YMCA, um, who is, is doing some, um, uh, some camp activities and about ways to kind of engage with their students, um, both in an educational way and share some of this information, but also hear from them. So I think um, there's probably other groups like that that we could connect with who are still holding some youth programming. And um, that's one of the things we'll be, um, we'll be building on. I think I see that uh, the Emerald Necklace Conservancy has mentioned others too, and the Boston Nature Center. So all of these are things we can add to our list to tap into because we've had to really pivot a little bit um, since we can't do these activities in the park like we planned, um, but we hope to, and we wanna, we do really wanna hear from um, kids as well, who are not only, I think, gonna influence how we, how, you know, what goes into the plan, but it's also really important for them to think about, participate in planning and become stewards and um, kind of civic actors as well. So if people have ideas um, on that as well, you can, you can continue to send those to us and we'll, we'll think about how to reach out. Thank you. All right, our next question, um, this is Rhiannon again, is um, for Liza, um, who is uh, leading the charge on this project, um, landscape architect with the city of Boston. Um, Liza, for, um, I think this was uh, Fatima, um, this was more of a statement about um, just the other neighborhood meetings that are going on at the same time. I don't know, Fatima, if you want to ask, um, if you want to mention it yourself um, or ask it as a question, or I can um, go ahead and share with the group. I think you should, uh, you should be unmuted. Oh, hi, how are you? Good evening. Hi. Um, there is, I'm Fatima Al-Islam, I'm the chair for the Greater Mattapan Neighborhood Council. And in Mattapan um, monthly, there are at least 20 uh, neighborhood associations that meet from 6 to 8 or 8.30 p.m. during the week. Uh, right now, today, tonight, that began at about 6 p.m. and won't stop until about 8.30. There are three that are meeting right now. Um, and they would, if they weren't meeting, I'm sure they would love to have been um, part of the conversation. So uh, I would love to discuss afterwards how best to um, pass on the information to them and to make sure that they realize how to participate in the process. So that, that was, it was more of a statement for that way. The other um, items regarding participation from teenagers, Mattapan has a number of teen, um, very active teen associations, the Mattapan Teen Center, which is actually a Boys and Girls Club, and the uh, Mattapan Food and Fitness Coalition's Victor Shoes, which actually is a environmental and uh, biking organization. Um, and um, they're about 20 years old. The, um, those organizations know that they wish to be actively involved in the planning process. 
Thank you. That's all helpful information. And um, as we, you know, as as tonight's meeting wraps up, um, so that you know, and anyone else who's on this call um, knows, this meeting was or still is being recorded and will be posted to the project website. So anyone who's not able to attend tonight because they're double booked or it's just too much um going on they will be able to access the meeting and watch it at another time um and hopefully though i know everybody has a lot going on um some people maybe who couldn't attend tonight may have attended our noon time meeting today um we were hoping that by um, offering two meetings we'd be able to capture more people and given that we had similar numbers of participants in each meeting i think um, it really shows that it, it probably did help some people be able to access today's conversation. Um, and just one more point that there are so many more ongoing engagements um, as we move forward with this plan. And as we are able to use Zoom, hopefully um, more people will be able to tune in. We have some daytime discussion groups scheduled um, in the coming weeks, as well as evening. Um, and we'll constantly be looking for ways to fold in as many voices in those conversations. So thank you for the suggestions of additional groups, um, Adama, to, to reach out to. Great. Our um, next question is from Jefferson. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and ask uh, Lydia to answer this one, but um, let's see, I'm finding you Jefferson. All right, so you should be able to unmute yourself or it looks like you're already unmuted. Um, would you like to ask your question um, to Lydia and the team? Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, thanks for putting this together. Um, my question is just about um, any ideas on um, making this space a more runner and cyclist friendly. Because uh, that's cause basically what brings me to the park, and um, seems to be like a lot of people use the park for the for exercise as well. So, just thinking about ways to further um, promote physical activity in the in the park. Thanks, Jefferson. Um, that's a great point, and something that we've seen in responses over and over. Um, and also in our own experiences of being out in Franklin Park that the circuit loop is really probably the most well used piece of the park. It's a place where um, that idea of kind of neighborhood parks where people are kind of just sticking to their edges disappears. Everyone's, that's a common place where everyone's kind of coming together and, and using it for learning to ride a bike, um, you know, walking their dog, exercising. Um, so you know, it's exciting to think about the potential of in increasing people's um, opportunities to use that how they want to. Uh, the other thing that we see a lot of opportunity in um, is thinking about circuit drive. Right now, it really is almost like a highway that cuts through the park. And um, there's so many ways that, that could be improved and really become part of a park experience where you're able to walk, ride your bike, run, and have cars move through the park as well as transit. All of those things can really work together in a successful way if it's done correctly. And um, you know, we also have to think about not just people kind of moving back and forth on that road, but also how pedestrians can cross it. Um, and that's part of this idea about how we can kind of start to stitch the, the two sides of the park back together and encourage people to kind of explore and visit all the opportunities that the park has. So. Um, definitely something that we will be looking into. Appreciate your question. Okay, thank you. The next question comes from Kathy Brown. Kathy, I'm going to, um, actually Kathy does not seem to be on here right now, but I think it's a great question. So I'll go ahead and ask it for John. Um, she was wondering what the timeline is, and I don't think that um, we spent much time on that earlier when we looked at the schedule. If you could maybe let people know the timeline of the project. Thanks, Lauren. I'm actually going to ask Lydia to talk about this one because I think she can pull the slide up and talk about it more directly.
All right. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Mel. I scrolled all the way back through. Um, that's a great question. And uh, this is kind of a, a fun graphic of our, our schedule and our timeline for the project. We are about nearing halfway through the process. So it's an 18 month plan planning process and we're, we're nearing the middle of it. Um, we've gone through kind of a phase of fact finding, understanding the park, talking to the neighbors, getting out there when we used to be able to and interacting with you. Um, and now we're at this point as we kind of ended the presentation where we've, we've learned a lot and heard a lot and um, we've been able to form that into kind of some draft goals and or principles as we're calling them. And basically that's gonna inform the way that we move through the next half of the project, which will run through April of next year. Um, our next steps are really about testing ideas. There's so many ideas that have been shared. A lot of them have repeated, some of them haven't. And what we have to do is really start to weigh those things against each other. We have to think about um, programming, impacts on maintenance, how that would tie into kind of funding and implementation. So there's a lot of things to think about. It's kind of like a big puzzle that we'll have to kind of test options, share those options with the public, let you weigh in, go back to, you know, to the drawing board and kind of again, let that input inform um, where we end up in the end, which will be essentially um, a list of priority projects that will then enter this last phase about taking action at the end, which is really about understanding implementation and how those things can start to actually be put into place. So um, short answer is we're about halfway through and this will go until April of next year. Okay, um, and we realize it's 8.30, it's almost 8.30, so we're almost at two hours for um, this workshop. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, just start answering the, direct, the questions directly, if that's okay with all of you. Um, the next question's for Lauren. Is um, the golf course public or private? Are there golf lessons for the general public? So the golf course is actually a public course. Um, people can get a membership, but you don't have to get a membership in order to play. Um, in terms of golf lessons, they're also open to the general public. And one of the things that the recreation department actually does, which is pretty amazing, is they do some wonderful um, free golf clinics for kids. Um, and they actually are even started doing that and opening that back up um, during uh, the last couple of weeks. So that's something that's pretty fun that they're doing as well. And I'll go ahead and ask the next question, um, which came in from Ricky Thomas for Stephen. Um, how will equity be included in all goals, um, access, resources, economic benefits, i.e. employment and contracts? Um, so um, I think Liza answered this question. It may have been on the earlier um, call. Um, but I think the, the goal for all planning um, processes in Boston is to be uh, as inclusive as possible, but also to keep as many of the dollars um, that are being spent in communities within the boundaries of those communities. Um, so um, I, maybe Liza is, is a better person to sort of fill in what that means for this planning process. Um, yeah. but, uh, but that's the general goal for the city of Boston and for this planning process. Yeah, I think that um, in terms of contracting and um, making sure that the dollars we have to spend here at Franklin Park and with other city projects, park projects, um, you know, stay within the community as much as possible, or you know, if not within the community, within the city, um, there are goals that are set by um, the Boston Reg Residence Jobs Policy Act, um, and all of our contractors are required to comply with that. We know that that isn't enough and that um, by having those policies in place, we don't see um, a lot of contracts going to local um, contractors and we don't see you know, huge numbers of local residents. So I, my understanding is this is something that will continue to be looked at. I think it's clear that the city doesn't have um, 
a lot of local, you know, a lot of our contracting dollars going to, to local um, business owners or contractors. So as much as we can push for that with this project, we will. I mean, that's a part of it is through advocacy or, or, or identifying the opportunity, um, talking about it, putting that idea on the table. Um, and, you know, hearing support from the community about that being something that people want to see. And then the other piece of that equation is making sure that city policy and state law um, follows suit or allows us to push that forward. So it's going to be um, something that can move forward through a couple of different um, channels coming together. Thank you, Liza. Uh, I have another question for you. Um, it is from someone by the name of Jay. Um, they're asking if there, if we have any considerations about how to cross or move through the golf course um, as a circulation path from one neighborhood to another. I love that idea. I think that um, that's something that we should look at within within the plan. Um, even though we're not planning the golf course per se as part of this. Um, connections through the park are really important, as we've been talking about tonight, and looking for opportunities um, to, you know, I, we'd have to look carefully at how those kinds of connections could happen without, you know, putting somebody at risk of being whacked by a golf ball um, or, you know, interrupting that use of the park. And if, are there ways for the, that kind of circulation to coexist? I would hope so. And I think that we should be looking for that. And, and, um, trying to bring people, you know, through that space safely and and give people access to the center of the park that's just on the other side of the course. Thank you, Liza. Um, the next question is going to go to Bree. Um, someone says, when my kids were younger, things like the kite festival, starry night gazing, bike paths, and um, campfire story time um, were exciting and memorable. Can kids these days still do some of that? Yeah, I love it. I'm getting all the kids questions. Um, so I'll try to try to channel. It was really fun. One of the first questions that we asked um, in the survey and at the first public meeting was around people's memories. And a lot of those memories were hearkening back to when the attendees were kids. And so we did hear about a lot of these um, these different activities and then ideas like people would do things like name the hills um, in Franklin Park, things like Hamburger, Hamburger Hill and things like that. So there's a real, um, I think those memories linger with people and we want to figure out how to create programs and opportunities for people to have experiences that they carry for 30 years like um, like this question uh, mentions. Some of them I know can be done still today. Um, you know, maybe not in 2020 COVID setting, um, the Kite Festival, but that was one of the first events that happened right at the start of when we began this planning process. So I think you know, when the design team first looked at Franklin Park with the designer's eye, that was, uh, that was what we attended and what we saw. And um, so that made a big impression on us as well. So that's still something that um, can be done in usual times. I love the ideas of the more passive events though, and how do we build those in? And one of the things we've been looking at um, is kind of mapping out the organizations. I think we've all talked about that and starting to cultivate and build more um, connections because some of these things that you're describing could be, um, through partnerships with uh, with neighboring communities or centers that already have connections to, to youth. So it could be, you know, something you do informally with your family or um, more of a, a formal program that's offered. Um, and I think, you know, the things that can't be done, we can think about how, how to try to nurture those within the plan. Um, public transit is a separate part of that question in a way. Um, uh, and I think, you know, ties into the, all the connectivity challenges. We know that um, it is hard to get to. And so how do, how do those um, activities for kids uh, find their way across kind of all corners of the um, park so it's more accessible? Thank you, Bree. Uh, the next question is for Stephen um, from Joe Backer. Um, in this question, he asks, um, he mentions Boston is a very segregated city and Franklin Park appears to exist right along one of the informal boundaries of that segregation. Um, how can the improvements of Franklin Park respond to that and encourage a shared experience? Uh, yeah, this is a great question. And it's, um, it's really kind of like the challenge and the charge uh, for all of us moving forward. 
Um, you know, we, we know that parks and public spaces um, can be directly tied to um, health outcomes. Um, they relate to um, housing costs and the changes in housing pricing and affordability. They uh, relate to um, other economic development, such as um, the development of um, additional job opportunities, small businesses, et cetera. Um, this uh, team is charged um, with looking primarily at the, the space within that boundary line of the, of the formal park. Um, however, because of the awareness of the relationship of the park to the communities as they exist today in a very segregated state and the potential influence that investment has uh, in changes that also may be harmful to existing communities, um, if not sort of uh, focused to, to have them be um, helpful, uh, then, um, then the, you know, the, if we're not focused on that, then the, the plan is going to potentially not do what we wanted to do. So that's one of the main reasons why at the beginning, um, we started by identifying uh, roughly 70 or 75 um, community-based organizations um, that we've reached out to from the start of the the planning process and we um, then solicited additional feedback from community members at the last community meeting because we know that there are a lot of community groups that are working on these other issues um, and these other um, topic areas within the surrounding communities and so although this project is not explicitly taking those um, things on um, partnerships with people who are will make the work that we're doing more successful and the work that they're doing more successful as well. Thank you, Stephen. The next question I think I can try to answer um, came from Kathy um, and she asks, what about permeable surfaces for paths? Um, they seem to be firm, not sure if they are ADA. This was in question, I believe, about the asphalt when it came up. Um, yes, permeable surfaces, let me rephrase, some, some permeable surfaces, yes, do meet ADA. Some are a little rougher and don't meet um, the smoothness threshold. Um, I think permeable surfaces, just like I was saying, in terms of um, what pathways are we're going to be using, that decision hasn't been finalized yet as part of the master plan. Um, it might be a project by project basis. And I think permeable surfaces are something that we can discuss. One of the things that um, a lot of people don't know about permeable surfaces is that they do have to be maintained. Um, many of them do have to be vacuumed out in order to um, maintain that permeability and, and that, um, that does take a level of maintenance. And so that will all be factored into decisions when we're talking about um, pavement materials moving forward. And the next question I think we were going to send to Ree, which came in from Margaret Cameron. Um, and it was, can you connect with all of the YMCA's of Greater Boston and Boys and Girls Clubs of Boston and Dorchester? A great question, Margaret. Um, and it's as though you're reading our minds or engaged in our process. We are, um, I think, as um, Liza might have mentioned or Stephen mentioned early on in the presentation, there are many stakeholder organizations that exist around Franklin Park. Um, and the YMCA is one that um, we've put a lot of, um, we've started a lot of conversations with about um, better engaging youth um, because we recognize that, um, as Fatima mentioned, um, that we are, um, they're often left out of the planning process. Um, so finding ways to engage with them both as partners in this, um, as well as um, ways to share all of our insights about Franklin Park and understand what their aspirations are for the park. And then our next question is for Liza. We only have a few more questions left and then we are all done. Um, Liza, um, Someone asks, are all improvements to the park being placed on hold until this plan is implemented? Um, for example, the tennis courts. Um, and then another question, just to kind of tag onto that one, can you describe the specific time frame or timeline for the start and completion of all improvements once planning stages are done? Um, I think it's the timeline for implementation of all improvements is really hard to say at this point in the process. We need to get um, further into the recommendations and then really look at phasing around those recommendations to have a full sense of timeline. With uh, $23 million worth of um, money set aside for designated currently for capital improvements, 
those could last a while depending on the scale of the projects that we undertake or they could be spent quite quickly on um, you know a couple of quite significant projects in the park so we'll have to see um, what comes out of the, the next phase of the project and hear how the community responds to the recommendations. Um, in terms of our park improvements put on hold right now, um, yes and no. So we recently finished uh, multi-year projects that Lauren was referencing before with um, pathway improvements. So Franklin Park has been um, a major recipient of, of capital dollars in recent years. We are, though, aware of um, the importance of understanding priorities through this process before we engage in the next round of capital work. We should be able to move forward with some early action projects as we get a little bit further, because um, it's not that we don't want to be spending money at the park, especially as we have money ready to, ready to go, but we wouldn't want to, for instance, resurface a set of courts that perhaps we would then recommend uh, reorienting slightly or expanding or you know, making some recommendation like that as part of the master plan so that um, that resurfacing work would have been done um, prematurely. So I think we should know more in the next, I would say, six months about how we can best prioritize work and hopefully um, get some early action projects happening so that you know, everyone can see the kinds of improvements that we're all excited to see in the park. Thanks, Liza. And like Reese said, we're getting close to the end. We've got two questions left, so we appreciate everybody sticking with us. Um, this second to last one is going to go to Lydia. And the question comes in from Fatima. And her question is, how is the Franklin Park Action Plan being done in conjunction with the Blue Hill Avenue project? Thanks, Fatima. Um, that is a great question. And Blue Hill Avenue is one of many projects that's going on around the park either currently at the same time as our kind of project schedule is moving forward or um, recently in the past. So as part of this process, we have um, been reading, understanding any past planning that would start to inform um, ways that we should be thinking about uh, this project as we you know, study it and move into design proposals. Um, as well as, you know, attending meetings of other people that are doing projects that are connected directly to the park. So one of those, of course, is the Blue Hill Avenue. We need to understand what they're looking at, what they're prioritizing. And so, again, looking for places where we can um, make the most of our, our priorities and our implementation, so that we're kind of checking multiple boxes, we're being efficient with the funding and um, meeting needs of, of multiple um, communities. So absolutely um, understanding what that, that planning process is looking at as well. Thanks, Lydia. Last question of the day. Uh, Matthew Murphy asked, um, did the question about the feasibility of an enclosed dog park get answered? Bree, this one's for you. Um, has this been considered? <laughs> There are many dog owners who enjoy the park and a dog park would enhance community connections and improve safety. I can take the kids and dogs questions. Um, so Matthew, you caught us. We tried to sneak this in um, and answer this question during the presentation. But um, just to be more clear, this is definitely something that has come up in a lot of um, feedback so far in the comments we got at the first public meeting in the first phase. And I think we've seen a lively um, kind of side chat about this today that um, you know, not only dog owners appreciate that, but I think also people who you know, just um, want the off-leash dogs to be kind of more, um, more managed. And so there's, there's multiple sides and, um, uh, to the conversation. So, you know, I think this is definitely something we know to consider. Um, we haven't looked into feasibility of all the different ideas like this. We're just sort of at the point of ending the brainstorm and the kind of idea generation, and we'll start to move into testing. So I think, um, I think like Liza said, hard to answer kind of when things will be implemented. Um, we don't yet have a full answer about the kind of feasibility of this, but we hear a lot from the community how we have to um, have to test it and look at it. So that that comes next. So that concludes the Q&A portion of our um, second workshop. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, you can see if you need to get in touch with us or have additional questions after the 
the workshop, you can contact Lauren Bryant. Her information is on the slide, um, but I'll read it to you. Um, her email is um, lauren.bryant at boston.gov. Um, thank you again for joining us and sticking around for two hours. Um, we really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Have a great Thank night. Thank you all. Thanks.